And here's four. Hey, everyone. Test, test, test. Microphone check. All right. So my co-presenter just left five minutes ago because of a family emergency. So uh, it's all me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a little bit of a different kind of topic than what you've heard so far. Uh, think of this as uh, we're going to talk about uh, our Facebook's internal two-factor implementation. And I think what's really neat about this story is that it's uh, a good counterpoint to some of the other ones, where this is uh, really a story of how we rolled this out, a lot of the, the sort of war stories that happen along the way. And uh, hopefully that'll impart some, some wisdom for some of you that are looking at doing something similar to, to what kind of pain or, or not pain you might uh, run into. So we're going to talk about two-factor. I think you guys all know what that means. Um, we have, uh, you know, talking about scale, uh, we have about 6,000 employees, which, uh, you know, depending on where you're coming from, is either a big or a small amount. Um, but uh, to us, it's enough that this became uh, interesting. Um, of those th uh, thousands of employees, we, we have thousands of engineers. And this, this solution is, is interesting because uh, it actually targeted engineers specifically, um, which has their own share of, uh, of specific uh, challenges. So I'll talk about that. And each of these engineers is doing millions of authentication events every day. OK, so we'll, t we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But let's, let's dive in then to talk about engineers uh, at Facebook specifically. So you guys have seen the posters on the wall, right? You've probably gotten some notion of what our culture is like. Um, we talk about this notion of move fast. This is not really a joke, right? This is a very serious core value. That means that um, we do everything we can to make it so that people are empowered uh, to do basically their job without anything in their way, or the minimum amount of friction in their way as possible. So that makes it a really great place to work, but it also makes it challenging to uh, do security in, at some times. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, engineers are very intolerant of anything that you put in their way that slows them down, that makes it so that they have to jump through a few more hoops in order to do their daily job. It, it won't work. You can't pull that off here. Um, and if you try to, what happens is they, they're smart enough that they try to find ways around the solution, right? And I think you guys have probably all seen that where you're from, where you, know, you think you put a really cool security control in place, but then you find out that people are making SSH reverse tunnels or something and completely bypassing your, uh, your efforts, right? Uh, so I think in, in, we'll, t we'll talk about the SSH stuff, but engineers, are, uh, the way they work here is, by and large, they log into the, these things we call dev servers, which are uh, these Linux machines. They do their engineering work. They write their code. They commit their code, and so on. They test their jobs. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to implement two-factor on this thing that really hit to the heart of every single engineer's workflow in the company. So this was like a pretty bold, uh, ambitious thing that we were trying to do. And really, this talk is all about security and usability. And I think oftentimes we think of security and usability as being uh, orthogonal, as being uh, uh, enemies. And I think what, what we found over the course of this project is that that's not always the case. And I think you can actually implement security controls that affect every single thing that people are doing and still make them love it in the process without actually like tricking all of them. Um, OK, so let's give a little bit of background on why we wanted to implement 2 fac in the first place and why we wanted to do it uh, for SSH in particular. That seems like kind of a strange place to start, probably, for some of you, right? Well, um, those of you that know me know I, I always have to talk about the kill chain in every single talk, So, because um, I, I think it's such a cool concept. Kill chain, I think you guys have all heard of this, but it's essentially the notion of, uh, of, of a, it's a cognitive model for how to think about attacker behavior. It's a series of stages that an attacker must necessarily go through in order to achieve their goal, right? And you know, I won't go through every single stage in the kill chain, uh, but basically, you, know, you can think of things like reconnaissance, where they're learning about your environment, to compromising, getting an initial foothold in your environment, then doing some host recon. You know, a lot of what uh, Diogo was talking about in the last talk was actually how to detect these intruders as they're going through the kill chain, because they necessarily have to do these stages. They have to do internal reconnaissance to figure out where their target accounts are. They have to do lateral movement in order to move throughout your environment to get access to the data that they want. So this notion of the kill chain is actually a really powerful one that is actually one of our best allies. Um, so why do we implement two-fact for SSH? It's because we wanted to protect one aspect of it, which was lateral movement, right? So again, inevitably, you're going to get compromised, just like the last presentation talked about. When you do, and it's not if, it's when, when you do, you want to protect as best you can attackers from using that initial foothold and pivoting that into access into the rest of your environment. Okay, so one of the things that we wanted to do was say, okay, if we assume 
you know, for a mo in our model that one of our uh, engineering laptops got compromised. We want to make it so that those uh, attackers that have access to that device uh, have a hard time pivoting into our production environment and getting access to the data that they might be after. So that's really the, the impetus for this, uh, this project. Um, you know, I, c I say a couple other things here. We want to make sure that the local user is at the keyboard, so sort of separating the user, uh, the user behavior from the attacker behavior. Um, so let's move on. Okay, so how, do we, how, do, how was SSH actually being used in our environment? So this is some staggering numbers uh, that we found when we started looking at the logs. Um, so we had some users with 3,000 sessions a day of SSH access into the dev server tier that we were talking about. Obviously, that's non-interactive, so there's a lot of scripting and automated actions that were happening here. Um, but tens of thousands of sessions a day uh, in, in total, which is a pretty large amount of stuff to try to protect. And the other thing that's noteworthy is that it, those of you that know a little bit about SSH know that it can use a multitude of uh, authentication mechanisms. It's really a Swiss army knife, for better or worse, uh, for, of authentication. And so people were using all manner of things, including public-private key pairs, Kerberos, uh, as well as uh, Keyboard Interactive, which are uh, passwords. And so um, the other challenge of this was, A, trying to scale it so that it was something that people could use. Uh, at this level of scale, but also being able to work with these, all these multitude of authentication mechanisms uh, that people were, were using. So, okay, so we had a pretty big design challenge, right? We had to look at this landscape. We said, we want to secure this lateral movement, but how do we start? And so we went, just like all of us would, through the stages of analyzing existing technology, okay? And what we found was that uh, there's a lot of different options out there. So you guys are all familiar with OTP. You use them on all your consumer sites. Um, we, uh, you know, there's a lot of different form factors for using OTP. Um, essentially, it involves a, a number that's either uh, time-based or sequence-based that you then um, type in to uh, some sort of dialog box somewhere. Okay, uh, has, I'm sure all of you have done this, right? So you know what I'm talking about. So let's think for a minute about the, the user experience here. I think this works really well for the consumer use case. Um, it works well for infrequent use. But let's imagine if you're an engineer and you want to SSH into this dev environment, you know, tens uh, or, or maybe even 100 times a day, right? Obviously, it's just not going to work to pull your phone out of your pocket, look at a number, and then type that in the prompt, right? So like, what is good enough for consumers now for this new use case becomes actually extremely high friction looking at a token and typing that number, right? It's simply an unacceptable level of friction. And again, it's not just uh, you know, in general, but also for Facebook, right? We have a very move fast culture. Can you imagine us going to our engineers and saying, hey, you know, all you got to do is take this thing out of your pocket every time you want to log into a server? People would never accept something like that. So biometrics is another option, right? <laughs> I don't think this picture is actually supposed to be funny, so, so stop it. No. <laughs> Um, so biometrics uh, have a bunch of problems, right? So uh, you know, up until the iPhone 5S came out, um, you know, biometrics really weren't really mainstream. They have a bunch of problems, and even the iPhone, of course, is a very limited use case, right? It doesn't allow you to log into arbitrary services. So what are the problems with it? Well, of course, you know, there's the hardware problem, which is that you know, all the devices we have we use internally don't have these readers already on them. Okay, so you know you have to have these users, and of course Facebook's a modern company. We don't even have such a thing as a desktop computer here, right? So everybody only uses laptops. So you know they're on the shuttle, they're at the coffee shop, they're at their desk, right? We, it, it would be ridiculous basically for us to ask people to have a USB dongle stuck into their machine and having to carry that around with them everywhere. Um, so uh, you know, really there, there just wasn't much of an option there. Smart cards is another uh, example of a technology you might consider for something like this. Um, there's a bunch of problems with smart cards, as you guys probably know. Uh, limited device support, so we use a, a ton of Macs here. Um, the, you know, Macs do have a pretty good uh, smart card uh, support, um, so I'm not trying to single them out, but they're, they're in more modern reason, uh, versions of, uh, of Mavericks, uh, getting smart cards to work uh, can be a little bit problematic. In addition to that, though, this has all the problems of the biometrics that I just mentioned, which is the sort of carrying of various devices and having to plug them in and all that sort of stuff. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about smart cards, where they have an additional problem, uh, on top of all the problems that biometrics have, is this idea of presence. Okay? So this is a security property where really the whole point of implementing a second factor is we're trying to guarantee a user is really at the keyboard and it's not an attacker. 
Well, unfortunately, smart cards actually aren't, at least in the way they're most often deployed, don't actually do a good job of that. Um, you, the, you know, just several years ago, we saw various APT attacks uh, targeting smart card implementations um, and taking advantage of the fact that uh, the smart card is unlocked for a period of time uh, for usability reasons. And so when a user puts in their PIN, unlocks their smart card, it's available online on their machine for a certain amount of time before it goes offline again. Um, and that kind of thing is something attackers have actually already built custom tools to exploit. OK, so we surveyed all the existing technology. And we kind of left pretty disappointed. So we said, well, let's roll up our sleeves and figure out a new way to do this. And so what are, what are, our, what are our requirements? What are our design goals? We kind of went over most of these. But we want to support very frequent use. We actually want to authenticate every single time somebody SSHs into a server. This is pretty audacious. Okay? We want to be able to support flexible options. So if somebody wants to use uh, you know, not just a, a hardware token, they want to use another form factor, we wanted to be able to support that. Okay? People have different kinds of devices. Some people have iPhones, Androids, all these different things. How do we make all this coexist? Uh, obviously, we wanted, uh, as I just said, stronger authentication for every single session. Uh, we wanted to be able to deploy this quickly in a matter of months. And the support thing, so those of you that are all at enterprise, especially larger companies, We'll, uh, we'll appreciate the fact that uh, support of something like this is actually a really big deal. Lifecycle management, having a help desk, users with issues, users with lost devices, right? This is all actually a pretty uh, important part of the process, is getting all that right. And so um, uh, that was another design criteria. So here's what we ended up with. We, we used a pair of solutions um, with a couple of different vendors in the mix. Um, Duo Security and the YubiKey Nano. So let me talk about this a little bit more. So uh, Duo Security is a cloud provider that supports a flexible amount of different options. They support an uh, iPhone or an Android or even a Windows mobile or BlackBerry app that allows them to uh, do things like push notifications and authenticate that way. Um, so the nice thing is that Duo Security g gave us quick deployment, and it gave us flexible options. Okay? Now all of a sudden, we had the ability to do out-of-band SMS as an authentication mechanism. We had the ability to do push notifications and a bunch of other stuff. We had support out of the box for a bunch of different devices. But it wasn't good enough by itself. It wasn't good enough. And that's the thing that's important, right? We didn't stop there. Because even a push notification on a phone is too much friction for our users. If you're going to log in SSH, and you have to pull your phone out of your pocket, and you have to unlock it, and then you got to push something, again, we can do better. So we dug deep, and we decided that what we would do is also pair this cloud provider, this service that has these flexible authentication options, with something called the YubiKey Nano. So I think many of you guys probably are familiar with this device. It looks like what uh, the picture in the lower right corner there looks like. It's a, a little insert that goes in the side of your laptop, and you just touch the, all you do is touch this, uh, the flange with your finger, and then it's, uh, it acts as a keyboard device, um, and it spits out a token. So we paired these two solutions together, and it was uh, really quite an impressive uh, result. Because it meant that people that were very power users that were logging into their SSH servers constantly, all they had to do was touch the side of their laptop, and they were logged in. So it was really quite, quite impressive. But yet, if they were on, the on their, you know, they had flexible options. So if they lost their token or whatever, uh, we supported a whole bunch of different stuff. It had low operational overhead because we were using a cloud provider. Um, and we, uh, I mentioned here, uh, the YubiKeys could be programmed to support different uh, crypto algorithms. Um, we originally just had started using the HOTP algorithm, as I mentioned earlier. So that meant that if you just touched the side of the token, it would spit out a, a, si a six or eight digit code, uh, numeric code. And we switched to something called the YubiKey AES, Yubico AES, uh, which is a which is a, I, I don't want to go into too much of the details on, but it has some pretty nice crypto properties. And one of the cool things is about pushing the side of the token is that um, since it's a keyboard device, you don't have to wait for the user to type in this giant key. So you can actually switch to something that's, ha that's more crypto cryptographically strong than like a six or four or eight digit number, um, because all the, all the user has to do is touch the, the key anyway. And so it, it has some nice properties there. Uh, OK. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of, the, uh, you know, we said, OK, this is a cool solution. Um, but how do we figure out if this is appropriate for our users, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, um, we use SSH logs in order to kind of dive into this. And, and in the case uh, uh, of us, we've been using Splunk. Um, other companies might use other, other systems for diving through logs. Um, but uh, anyway, so we wanted to spend a bunch of time looking at how SSH logs were used. I don't know how many of you guys ever looked at SSH logs before. 
They're like pretty crazy, right? So one of the things you'll notice right away is that you know it's not just one log line for a, a, an authentication session, right? There's like 20 or 30 different log lines that are spread out among all kinds of uh, disparate uh, entities. So one of the things that we notice right away uh, is that um, these SSHD logs can be tied together by using the PID. Um, so when we were doing a, Splunk has this feature called transactions, which you can actually do a search and uh, create a transaction, and that means you can actually look at SSHD logs um, by PID, which is tying the entire session together. In addition to that, we actually um, uh, added a bunch of logging features to SSH itself. So we actually maintain internally a series of SSH patches for doing things like logging of additional information, um, which allows us to be able to tie these logs together uh, in a way that we couldn't do before. So that's one thing that a lot of guys, a lot of you guys might not consider, is that you know SSH is actually something that's open source. It's something that you can that's malleable, um, and so you know, it's actually fairly easy to insert logging at least into it into the the, the code base. Um, and so uh, you can see that we you know we were able to tie these sessions together by by PID. Um, let's see. So this is uh, one of the things that we did. Is there there are some cases in which the PID uh, doesn't uh, ends up having problems. And so we actually added an additional session key uh, to the logs so that we could um, even better tie the logs together. So that's an example of a fairly simple change to OpenSSH that you can do that um, actually makes it a lot easier to do the log analysis. So that was, that was pretty neat. So after we did all this analysis of like staring at logs for a while, we came up with a, a list of what people were doing. And you know, we had sort of had this mental model like, oh yeah, people were just SSHing in and it's all good. And what we found is that um, that was kind of true, but there was actually a whole bunch of other craziness going on. Um, and so one of the things that was happening was a lot of people were using SFTP. So they weren't just logging in, they were actually using these clients on their, on their, on their laptops, like Expand Drive and so on, some I had never even heard of before, uh, and were SFTPing, uh, SFTPing into their dev environment. Other stuff that they were doing is running some random scripts uh, against their uh, dev environment. So while mo many developers log into their environment and do their thing, th some, some developers, like mobile application developers, actually run some scripts that download some stuff to their machine, and then they can program stuff on their local machine. Um, Tramp mode is another interesting case, which I had never even heard of before this uh, rollout, which is a feature of Emacs, uh, which allows you to remotely download uh, a file to your machine edit it, and then when you save the file, it uploads it back using SFTP to the server you came from. So apparently people were using that. Um, <laughs> it's like all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Um, and then again, like everybody was using every kind of Wild West authentication mechanism like uh, Kerberos and public private key and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, so this is kind of some of the details about what we did in the implementation. Um, this is a, a really interesting feature of OpenSSH that was released in uh, 6.2. Um, and so what we did was we, uh, we basically used allowed for public Kerberos and uh, password as the first primary factor. Um, remember, it's two-fact, right? So we have to have two factors. Um, and then we used the, this duo security uh, cloud service as the second factor. So there was a problem that we ran into right away uh, relatively early on um, that the way that the PAM stack was implemented uh, with Duo was that it meant that um, the password and the Duo authentication were both uh, handled by the key or keyboard interactive authentication method in OpenSSH. Um, so what we did is we worked with uh, the OpenSSH maintainers to actually implement a new feature in OpenSSH that's now available uh, that allows us to uh, have what's called sub-methods in OpenSSH, and that allows us to do things like having um, PAM, delegate to PAM, and then have Duo uh, both being uh, sub-methods for authentication, as well as ha allowing for Kerberos. So this was uh, one of the really nice things about, it's nice to know OpenSSH maintainers. Um, so <laughs> make friends with them. Uh, let's see. So, how do we handle SFTP? So, this is this was a, this was a particularly challenging case um, because you know we felt like we could get uh, normal people logging in in a pretty good place, but then there was all these people using these weird clients on their machines and like trying to figure out how to deal with that. Um, so, what we decided to do uh, at, at, so after a little bit of, of 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 thinking was essentially to implement uh, a CH root with a, sec a single factor. So. 
it, the reason for this is because if you look at how most of these clients are built, like I don't know how many of you guys ever use like Expand Drive or anything like that. Like I, I never really used it, but a lot of them actually don't even use OpenSSH as a client under the hood. They actually built their own jank, like crazy weird implementation, right? So they're not even using the actual OpenSSH library in the first place. They're just kind of like typing some stuff and waiting and then seeing if it works. So we had to kind of make a, like. A lot of companies uh, might, you know, just say, well, you know, if you're using this, screw you, because this isn't officially supported and whatever. But like, we wanted to try to see, okay, no, we're not going to do that. We want to figure out a way to both uh, try to meet our security goals, but most importantly, meet our usability goals. And so what we came up with was we created a, a ch root SSH um, daemon that allowed single factor SFTP for a whitelisted series of commands. And so the, our thinking was, we wanted to get this rolled out. We wanted our users to be happy at the same time. So what if we created a way for us to allow certain things, like downloading and uploading files, but not allow full takeover of a host or a full interactive shell on the remote system? Now, those of you guys that are smarty pants out there will think, OK, well, there are some security weaknesses in that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here. Um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, so uh, this is the same thing. I think this is uh, more or less the same idea over and over again. So um, we, we used uh, a ch root for SFTP, and then we used uh, something called an SSH whitelist for uh, scripts in tramp mode, um, because we wanted to control uh, what kinds of things that they could do. So th these are a couple different uh, types, a couple different solutions to basically the same class of problem. And so let's talk about that in a little more detail. So this is a regex. Uh, this is some, one of the types of things that we had to write rules for to allow existing clients that were SSHing in and doing things on the server. So for SFTP, we created a ch root. We said that it could, could never get an interactive shell, and we kind of had a restrictions on what it could do. For other things like strips that were legacy that we needed to grandfather in, we um, built you know kind of what 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 had a solution that you know, has its, has its warts, but it's better than nothing, uh, which is to basically have a whitelisted series of regular expressions that allow you to, uh, with a single factor, log in and do certain actions. Um, so those of you that know about regex know, you know, this has uh, probably some scary uh, issues, but it's a lot better than not being able to roll out the solution, and it's something that we've been able to improve over time. Okay, so... <laughs> So uh, the wolf meme is a particularly funny one, because uh, what we found was that as soon as we, we deployed these keys to people, uh, they started inadvertently uh, having key presses. Because it was so easy to use, the usability was so awesome that like, they started using it without even trying. Um, and so anytime you would accidentally touch the inside of your laptop or carry it wrong or something, uh, it would start spitting out these keys. And so instead of it being a, a negative uh, thing, it actually turned into kind of a funny supportive meme where people started posting these like uh, wolf pictures. And we actually have t-shirts that people made with this uh, Yubico strings on it. Um, so. Um, and actually, like we have some people that built like little tape, uh, like awesome tape things that like have a little flap that like flaps over the the key. Um, most of the uh, initial issues with errant key presses have actually died down, and we found that once people kind of get accustomed to it, um, it, it actually uh, is not too bad. Some of the other problems we had during the rollout were pretty hilarious, though. Um, so one of the ones that was maybe not so hilarious, but somewhat shocking, was that there's a tremendous number of different types of keyboard layouts in the world, which I have now become intimately familiar with all of them. Um, you know, we, we sort of naively assumed that everybody was using a, a normal keyboard, and we didn't really think about it. And it turns out that Yubico had, had anticipated some of these types of problems, where they, they, they actually use a series of uh, characters when you press the key, remember it's a keyboard device, right? They use a series of characters that uh, works pretty well for international languages, and you know it's actually a pretty good character set. But um, we found people that were using Dvorak keyboards. We found people that were using something called Colmac. Has anybody heard of this? I've seen a nod, so okay, cool. Um, and then there's something called Programmers Dvorak, which I had never heard of, and one person in our company was using. <laughs> so <laughs> we did. And he's not a plant. Um, yeah, we actually did cover it. So a, a, lesser, a lesser man and a lesser company might, um, might tell those people to screw off. But, <laughs> but we stood up to the challenge. And, uh, <laughs> and we actually um, just found a way to, to actually make those people uh, productive as well. And what we did was we actually uh, f have them fall back on HOTP. 
So one of the nice things about using the Duo service is we could actually program a few YubiKeys uh, with the HOTP eight digit um, instead of, uh, instead of the, the Yubico AES algorithm and have just those few people uh, authenticate using HOTP. So the, the service was there, it had the feature, it just worked. So we give those people the very special um, tokens and let them know they're special and, um, and it's all good. So everybody's happy. So that was pretty cool. Um, exploiting computers is a really good one. So uh, this is crazy. So uh, I showed you a picture earlier of the YubiKey Nano, right? So one of the things that we never thought would ever happen, happen, which is that people figured out a way to insert them in their USB drive upside down and backwards, right? <laughs> and it turns out when you do that, it actually has the metal part short out all the USB pins. And uh, yeah, it turns out like uh, most of the time it just causes your computer to instantly reboot. But every once in a while it actually destroys your, com your computer completely. Uh, which we found with like a few Lenovo machines, like completely died. Um, and this was despite us, you know, having clear pictures of like us with the token, like sticking it in the drive, you know. So, you know, I think one of the at scale takeaways here is like, you know, users at scale like are problematic. Um, and, you know, you, you have to go kind of the extra mile to uh, make sure that they uh, know how to insert the token. Um, we had a couple cases where we had quote unquote possessed YubiKeys where like somebody's key below 65 degrees uh, would start randomly typing. Um, so that was cute. Um, <laughs> uh, and there's a bunch of other stuff. I, I won't go into all of it, but uh, you know, this is kind of the interesting war stories that you don't find out until you go through something like this, right? Um, so just kind of to conclude, um, you know, you guys can do this uh, probably a lot easier than we did in a lot of ways, uh, depending on the culture and, and, and the nature of your company. Uh, we had a few edge cases, and instead of just ignoring them, we, we wanted to make it work for people. Um, other companies have different cultures and just want to be able to dictate a security solution. Um, and it's, this, this is super easy to implement. So we did this in a matter of months, which I, I'm really proud of. And that's a testament to the team, as well as the col company culture. Uh, which I thought was really neat. And uh, this is an, another point that I, that I really took away from the last presentation uh, by, by Diogo and Nathan, which is they were talking about how HSMs, once you have them, you, know, you can start like, you know, cleaning your kitchen and doing your dishes and everything else with them. Um, so it turns out when you have a two-factor system, uh, you can actually start doing all kinds of cool stuff. So you have a highly usable two-factor system that's good enough to use for every single SSH access that every single engineer does. Once you have something like that, you can start rolling it out on your email system. Maybe you can do it for your VPN. One of the coolest use cases that we did was actually we replaced password auth for sudo with a YubiKey push. That's awesome. So you know, you, w once you have this, something like this, you, you can start thinking of really neat ways to use it. Um, uh, so anyway, I think that's kind of it. Uh, I'm ready for questions. Since uh, thanks, I will try to answer all your questions. But since Tim is not here, uh, there may be things I'll have to defer. But I'll do my best. Tim impression. <laughs> do your users uh, complain during deployments or? Disasters. Oh, are you kidding me? They're like the most complainy, you know, people in the world. But for good reason, right? This is the thing. This is for good reason because they they want to be able to get their job done in the most effective way possible. And so I, I don't think of it as complaining. It's more like a constructive feedback, right? Because uh, you know, I don't want to implement something that's going to slow them down either. I really don't. You know, and in fact, I pride myself on being able to figure out ways to make people still move fast and implement security. So. Um, we did have people complain, and in fact, we had a bunch of, you know, of holdouts uh, that we had to work with throughout the process. Um, one of the things that we did is we kind of like had an internal, internal beta where people that were kind of early adopters and excited about it got on board, and then we kind of got their feedback first, and then we kind of like broadened it and broadened it until we got the like sort of slow late adopters last. And that kind of process really works well, because we can say, hey, 95% of your peers are loving this thing, like maybe you should just give it a try, you know? Cool. And do you have any other exceptions other than the one or two use cases with the keyboard layout? Exceptions to what? Uh, uh, the process of using the two-factor and the Duo security uh, or the YubiKey? No, actually we don't. So um, we found that uh, we were able to make it work for every single person that authenticates uh, into dev. There, there definitely are a few corner cases um, where 
Like, we did have a few engineers that initially said, like, hey, I need to open, like, 15 tabs at once. Like, this isn't working for me. And, um, you know, we, we did find uh, some solutions for them that, you know, uh, I'm not super proud of. Like, uh, you know, in some cases, we've had to implement port forwarding and that kind of thing. Um, I, the, the actual usage of that is, is actually really low uh, in practice because of the fact that people initially thought they were going to need to do that and found that it was so usable to actually SSH every time with the token, and it was actually more cumbersome to set up the port forward and all that, uh, that uh, you know, we do have users of that, but it's very few. Can you go more into how you implemented the whitelisting? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned in the talk, there were two classes of whitelisting. Um, the, what we did is um, we actually ran multiple uh, uh, versions of, of SSHD. And so the normal ver version of SSHD um, requires a second factor all the time for everything, right? And then we have a CH-rooted uh, uh, version that is uh, whitelisted for only doing SFTP and not interactive shell. Does that make sense? And then we have yet another version of SSHD that's listening on another port that uh, actually uh, is using a force command to restrict uh, all interactions through this regular expression uh, script. Does that make sense? OK. Back of the room? Well, okay, wait, you got a mic? OK, cool. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so my question is, um, did you apply this sort of solution for uh, the operations team as well? And uh, did you have any challenges with that? Like, for example, if they needed to do like an SSH sort of parallel job, how would that sort of thing work? Yeah, so actually let me answer your question in a, in a slightly different way that, that, that I think you'll enjoy, which is that um, our, one of the big tensions in deploying this, right, was like, you're going to use a cloud service for SSH? Like, you're insane, right? And th th that was actually one of the concerns that a lot of operational people had um, to, to such a design. Now, I, I'm pleased to say we've actually implemented it in such a way that, um, that uh, everybody uses it for every single access. Um, but the way we got over that hurdle was interesting. Um, Duo supports a feature for, uh, that you can implement on a per, uh, what they call integration basis. And so if, you know, d different things are different integrations. SSH may be one integration, maybe your mail system or your VPN are different. And so on a per integration basis, you have the ability to choose to fail closed or fail open. So that means that if, it can't, if, the, if the authenticator, uh, authenticating uh, endpoint can't contact the cloud service, uh, it could, you can choose to have it optionally fail open and log, right? So uh, you, you have, a, as an implementer, have the power uh, every time you, you implement this to decide whether or not you want to choose security or availability uh, for that. And, and, and what, that's really cool because it's really flexible. And so um, suffice to say, we found a nice middle ground for all the different integrations that we decided to implement uh, that made everybody happy, and uh, that's pretty cool. So. Yeah, up front here. Uh, let's get you a mic first. Do, do, you have, do, do you have developers who use IDEs to, to yeah. the code? And yes, how we do. do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah, awesome. So we totally do. We have a bunch of them. So the question is, how, how do we handle IDEs, right? So IDEs is a good, interesting case, which I, I didn't highlight, but we actually had to work through. So there's Eclipse. There's this thing called PHP Storm, which I never heard of. but uh, yeah, anyway. So uh, there's a bunch of different IDEs. Um, Emacs is actually kind of an IDE, and I talked about tramp mode. All the other different ones uh, we solved through using one of the three mechanisms I highlighted, right? Either we got them to work with two-factor, and actually some of them didn't have a janky implementation of OpenSSH, so that actually worked out of the box. Um, some of them couldn't do that, and so we got it to, we, we got it to work with the SFTP uh, CH-rooted um, service. Um, and uh, you know, some other IDEs. Be between those two things, honestly, we, we got most IDEs covered. Um, the SFTP thing in general, most IDEs t tend to support. So that, that, that actually worked for us. Any other questions, folks? All right, I guess I'll end early. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Paul.